most of us bear the name of a saint. And if your name is not a saint's name, you'll have to be the first. And even if we don't bear the name of a saint, we will when we're confirmed as we choose a patron saint for that sacrament. And while it's probably true that most of us were not named actually for a saint, we we're named for our grandparents or uh, a, an aunt or, or an, a relative whom we admired, but chances are they had the name of a saint. You know, in the scriptures, naming is important. People's names are changed to indicate a change in their vocation, a change in their focus, a change in, their, in God's plan for their life. And that's captured in the ritual of baptism when the priest or the deacon asks the parents and the godparents, what name do you give this child? Now, they had already given that child a name. They probably gave them a name before they were born. But certainly by the time they were born, their name was recorded in the official documents of the birth, the birth certificate, etc. The child already has a name. But it's precisely that moment of their baptism when that name is, in a sense, ratified. Because that's the moment in which God takes that child, without taking it from his parents, still takes that child and makes that child his own son or his own daughter. And in a real way, I think, the naming of children for saints, after the example of saints, is an incarnation of the doctrine that we commemorate today liturgically in this Feast of All Saints, the commemoration of all the saints. It's as if parents are saying when they give their child a name that is like a saint's name, I want my child to be a saint, which is another way of saying, I want my child to go to heaven because only saints go to heaven. Imagine if at the end of our life people say about us truthfully, oh, they were, that was a very good person. That was a very good person. They did this and they did that and they were, they were a good person. Would that be enough? Would that be a sign of success or failure? Only saints go to heaven. That's what it means to be a saint, to be in heaven. I don't know how many of us, don't raise your hand, would say that we anticipate when we die that people will say, oh, that person was a saint. And if they can't say that about us when we die, not that we're interested in what people say, insofar as it goes, but isn't that something of a sign of a failure at a certain level? That we fail to to reach the mark. That's why the church is so insistent that we keep before us the examples of the saints who are people just like we are, who had the same jobs we have, lived in similar circumstances, often lived in much worse circumstances, um, but who found a way to be faithful to God throughout it all, to not just to be faithful, to, but to be heroically faithful. And some of those have been canonized. We don't know how many people are in heaven, the, the first reading from the book of Revelation, we'll visit that in just a moment, gives this vision of 144,000 who are saved. And of course, if we know something about Jewish numerology and how that appears in the scriptures, 12 is the number of completion, so 12 times 12 uh, times 1,000, which is a number that represents kind of infinity. So a huge number that cannot be calculated. Although there is a Christian sect, we're well, not really Christian, a religious sect, that holds that that number is literally true. There are only 144,000 who are destined for heaven. And that sect has over 2 million members. <laughs> so someone's not really doing the math there. Or they, you know, I'm not sure what's going on. But it, it's a countless number. So we know even though a handful, literally a few thousand at the most, have been canonized by the church, held up for us publicly, as examples of heroic virtue. There, there are countless others. We can't begin to know how many. But we want to be among their number. And that desire is expressed in the Apostles' Creed. Now we recite the Nicene Creed at, at Mass, and it encapsulates some of these same ideas, but in a different way. But the Apostles' Creed is much more ancient, dating probably from the first century. And many Christian bodies recite the Apostles' Creed. And it concludes by saying what? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. So what does this mean, the communion of saints? One of the articles of our faith. 
Well, if we turn to the Catechism, it instructs us that this phrase, communion of saints, refers to communion in holy things and communion among holy people, where communion means, quite literally, a deep and abiding interior union with another. That's why we call the reception of the Eucharist at Mass Holy Communion, because it's a moment to enter into a deep and abiding interior unity with Christ through the reception of his body, blood, soul, and, and divinity. So the church tells us that the communion of saints means that by virtue of our baptism, by which we became children of God, something that's mentioned in the epistle from the first letter of St. John, that we have the ability through God's grace to enter into, to have a unity in holy things. Well, what are these holy things? St. Paul sums it up. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's nothing more holy than God. And the gift of faith that he gives us and the gift of the sacraments beginning with baptism by which we are nourished and sustained in, in that communion with the Lord. But there's also communion among holy persons. Which is to say that we have a spiritual bond with all those who are in union with God, whether we know them or not, and whether they're living or whether they're dead. If they have, if they've continued to live in God in, in, in the life to come, then we continue to have a unity with them. And we speak, therefore, not only the church on earth, the pilgrim church or the church militant, because we're fighting a battle all the time, a spiritual battle, but also the church in heaven, the church triumphant, and the church in purgatory, those who are still being cleansed, having died in friendship with God, but being cleansed before entering into the fullness of the wedding banquet. And so it's fitting that we have a time when we recall that doctrine as we do on the 1st and the 2nd of November, because today is the solemnity of all saints, tomorrow is the commemoration of all souls. So today we rejoice and thank God for the gift of the saints, those who are in heaven. And we pray that many members of our families and friends who've gone before us are among that number. And then tomorrow is a day when we pray, especially for those who are still undergoing purgation, who are happier than we could be on this earth because they know their salvation is assured, but their, their wedding garment is still being prepared for them because they were not quite um, um, equipped to enter into eternal life, although by their life they did not merit to be separated from God. And so the, today's readings illustrate something about this communion of saints. Again, to return to that first reading, or to the gospel reading, from, from the beginning of the, of the um, Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5 of the Gospel of St. Matthew, the Lord begins that long discourse with the Beatitudes. He's giving us an instruction manual that together with the Ten Commandments tell us how to live so that we can be saints. What does it take to be a saint? Well, we just turn Matthew chapter 5. Or turn back to Exodus or Leviticus and the, and the Ten Commandments. If we can begin to instantiate those truths in our life, then we'll, we're on a lo we've taken some big steps in order to live um, a life of holiness, to become saints. It's not just a question of obeying rules, although these, the Beatitudes and the Commandments involve rules, certainly, a way of forming our life, but a way of orienting our heart before anything else. This is how we love God more. This is how we love our neighbor more. So whenever we're confused, it's always good to go back and reread the directions. And of course, in many practical ways, a lot of people are not very good at reading directions. If we went over to Ikea or one of the stores like that or ordered online a bookshelf, it would come packed in all its different pieces all stacked together with a little bag for the tools that are useless and all the little connectors and everything else. And there'd be a paper in there that would be in instructions, usually without any words. And it would have little dotted lines showing you where to put this and where to put that. And most men would not, men would never look at the instructions. They would just say, oh, well, this looks like it goes there. <laughs> bang it in. This looks like it goes over there, and in the end there's some stuff left over, and you go, well, what is all this extra stuff for? And of course, most women, this is not universally true, most men would do that, and most women would lay everything out, they'd read the instructions twice, maybe three times, they'd lay everything out, they'd put all the little widgets and tools, and that, you know, those little, the little socket, the little uh, Allen wrench that really is so hard to use and everything else they put it all out and then they they get one of their teenage sons or their husband come and come and put this together here and then she'd tell you how to do it 
and I put this over. I think that that's not universally true, but that's largely true. Um, but if we don't read the instruction manual that God has given us, how can we be surprised that there's some extra pieces that don't fit in our life, or that something is not working correctly? So we're, you know, we're on this feast of all saints. Jesus is saying, "Blessed are those you will be holy." In other words, holy are those. Holy with H, capital H, holy are those who do this and who do that and who avoid this and who avoid that. In other words, whose heart is fixed, to say heart means our will, is fixed upon the things of God. And then the epistle, the second reading from the first letter of St. John, chapter 3, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 3, gives us the foundational understanding of, the holy, of holiness of life. What does it mean? Well, it, what is it built upon? It's built upon being a child of God. You know, there's so many people in our day and age, I think, who are confused by either their identity, who they are, why they're here, what's the purpose of their life. Everybody goes through that to one extent or another, especially when we're teenagers or young adults, trying to figure out our place in life and, and, and be going in the right direction. I think it's kind of more an issue today than it's ever been. Maybe we just notice it more. I don't know. But it's, it's certainly some people seem to be torn apart by it. But, you know, if we ever forget who we really are, a child of God, a son or daughter of God our Father, and not just in, by way of analogy, but in a real and true way, an adopted child is a real child of their adoptive parents. They're not just an analogously a child. I have a cousin who, with his wife, have five children. A couple of them are their natural children, and three of them are adopted children. Are those adopted children any less the children of my cousins? No, of course not. Are they treated any differently? No. Are they loved any less? No. And anyone who's adopted a child know that that is your child. And if you're adopted, you know your parents love you as if you were their, a natural born child as opposed to a child that they adopted. God has adopted us. And it's not just, by, again, by way of analogy, he's, he's, um, he's really incorporated us into his... The, in a certain sense, his family life. That's our fundamental identity. And if we're ever confused about how we should be living, what we should be doing, the direction that our life is taking, we need to always return to that point. You know, if we ever question, uh, well, who am I? Why am I here? We return to that point. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. That should define our life. And if we don't start from that point, we don't get that foundational understanding right, we may not get anything else right. Because if the foundations are, you know, as the scripture says, the foundations what destroy, once destroyed, what can the just do? So if we, do, if we haven't built up or we don't recognize that foundation which God has already built up in us, we're going to be confused. So we're grateful that we, the word of God is here reminding us on the Feast of All Saints that, you know, don't forget that you're a child of God. And then in that book of Revelation, not only is that the interesting kind of glimpse into heavenly life, but what is the characteristic of those who are in heaven? The passage that we heard ended with a verse from chapter 7, verse 14, describing the saved. He said, their robes, uh, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, obviously, the blood of the Lamb refers to Christ, his passion, death, and resurrection. But it's an interesting image because blood never purifies Blood never makes anything clean. Blood ruins, ruins fabric if it falls on it. Uh, in, in fact, in the Old Testament, coming in contact with the blood of another person rendered the Jew unclean. That's why in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Levite and the priest passed by the man who had been beaten up. They, who had been beaten up because if they had tried to help him, they would have come into contact with his blood. It would render them ritually unclean, which means they could not have carried out their priestly or Levitical duties until they had gone through a, a rite of purification and a kind of spiritual quarantine. It would have upended their life at least for a few days. So, you know, blood, does, human blood anyway, doesn't purify. In fact, I, you know, some years ago, I was celebrating the early mass here on one morning, 6.30 in the morning. And as I was unfolding the, purifi the uh, corporal, which is that square cloth that the priest unfolds, you know, and the, the chalice is placed on that and the, and the uh, ciboria that hold the host and everything. It's called corporal from the Latin word for, corp for body, corpus. It's the cloth in which the body of Christ is placed. And as I'm opening that cloth and beginning the prayers of the offertory, blood appears on the corporal. Now, I have witnessed, uh, not directly, but indirectly, miracles in which 
the host is at the fraction of the Lamb of God is broken and bleeds onto the corporal. I visited some years ago a, a miracle that's been preserved in Orvieto. It happened in Bolsena in central Italy. Uh, but it's, uh, it's called the miracle of Bolsena. But this corporal is framed in a reliquary above an altar which has spots of blood. The priest who was celebrating Mass was having doubts about the real presence, and as he broke the host at the Lamb of God, it bled upon the corporal. And that event helped to lead to the establishment of the Feast of Corpus Christi, which we celebrate you know, towards at the end of the Easter season. And uh, so I had heard about these things, and I'd seen one of these ancient relics. This is in the 13th century. And so here I'm opening up. Here at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, blood is appearing on the corporal. The problem was I'd cut myself shaving that morning. <laughs> and I didn't notice it until I started bleeding on the, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I told the people in the mass, okay, I need to, I'm, I cut myself. It's not a Eucharistic miracle that's taking place. You know, don't tell anybody. We'll be overrun with pilgrims. You know, it's just, you know, it's not going to happen. So I had to burn the corporal because there's no way to get the blood out of it. But the blood of Christ is different. We hope it leaves a mark, but not a stain. But it always purifies. And of course, this tells us something about holiness of life, that it comes from God. It doesn't come from us. It's not just a question of our own efforts. It's not a question of being a spiritual superman. I remember a story about a, a, a world-renowned violinist, a great talent, one of the greatest who ever lived, who was complimented after one of his concerts by an admirer. This is a true story. By an admirer saying, you know, maestro, your violin makes, makes such a beautiful sound. And he kind of looked at the person, and he lifted up the violin, which he still had in his hand, and he listened to it. And he said, I don't hear anything. The violin was just the instrument, literally and figuratively, for making the sound that only this virtuoso could make. In a similar way, we're like instruments. But only God can bring out the sound that he desires and that he wants. But he relies upon our cooperation. He relies upon us to use our freedom. He's not going to work against our freedom. That's how much God loves us and, and respects us. That's the way he made us. That we, He wants us not to have holiness of life imposed upon us, which he will not do. And we know he won't do it because we're not saints yet. He wants us to be, but we're not. That means he doesn't impose himself. But he does invite us to allow him to enter. So maybe as we celebrate all saints today, and keep in mind all those we, we want to be praying for in the month of November, maybe we can need to find some new ways, or renew old ways, of allowing God to enter into our life. Of learning to say yes to him. Of learning to... To, to embrace the commandments, to embrace the Beatitudes more, more fully, more, uh, more wholeheartedly, so that we can be one day numbered among those saints whose robes have been washed and made holy and pure in the blood of the Lamb.